evening, what time of day is it? I don't know. <laughs> Looking to the Americans there. Well done on staying awake so far. Good. It's great to have you with us. My name's Neil. I'm one of the pastors of City Church and also leading here at our second city congregation. And uh, we're delighted you can come and join us and be part of our time together uh, this afternoon. I don't know who's seen the fil- who's seen the film The Terminal. Anyone seen The Terminal starring Tom Hanks, Catherine Zeta-Jones, maybe about half of us? Uh, I found it a pretty forgettable film, all in all. If you haven't seen it, you haven't missed a great deal. It's not one of the most uh, interesting ones. Um, But in the movie, Tom Hanks plays an Eastern European passenger who gets stranded at JFK Airport. He's stranded because there's um, a civil war breaks out or something like that in back in his home country, and he can't go home, and yet he can't get clearance to enter the country. So he's kind of stuck in no man's land. There he is in an airport uh, with nowhere to go. And uh, the result is that this transit lounge becomes his home. That's his new home. And at the end of the movie, you find out that actually the idea for the film came from a true story. A true story about a man called Mehan Karini Naziri. Uh, Kara, uh, K- uh, Naziri was an Iranian refugee who had f- had the unfortunate experience of living in Terminal 1 of Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. Not just for a few hours, or for a couple of days, or even a few months, but uh, Naziri, get this, lived at Terminal 1, Charles de Gaulle Airport, for 17 years. 17 years it was his home from 1988 until his refugees pa- when his refugee papers were stolen until the year 2006 when he needed urgent medical attention 17 and he was taken to the local hospital 17 years in a terminal of an airport so next time you find yourself stuck for a few hours and there's a delay you know you can put it in some kind of perspective can't you um, what should be a temporary stopping place, a transit lounge, had become for this man his permanent home. Now, why start with a story like that as we uh, think about this Bible passage before us today? Um, Well, it seems to me it, it describes our situation or our experience as Christians, if we're here today as Christians. And we've been looking at a short series in Second City since January called Eternity Changes Everything. How our view of the future impacts our lives today and can enable us to live lives for Jesus Christ. And part of the need is to have a whole sort of mindset shift in terms of how we think about life now. Do we think about this world as our permanent home or do we think of it more as a transit lounge in some sense? I guess none of us would try and set up home in a bus shelter. And when it comes to the Christian life, we shouldn't try to set up home in this world. Last time round when I was here, we were talking about how the Apostle Paul even likened his own body to an earthly tent compared to that of a permanent home, an eternal home uh, with God. And that's why Paul did not think about this world as his home. And in the letter to the Philippians, he said this. He said, to live is Christ, to die is not game over, to die is gain. That's really to gain. Death is to gain. Why? Well, listen to what he says a little bit later in the letter in in chapter 3 of Philippians. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that, talking about eternity, for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I press on I'm not home yet. I'm in a transit. I'm just passing through. I'm waiting to get home. And what we've seen all the way through this series is that for that to really grip our imaginations, two things have to be true. We have to believe we have a future that is certain and a future that is glorious. We really have to be persuaded of that. There are a lot of Christians who worry about their standing or their status before God. They they take a look at themselves and they say, I'm not the person I even want to be, let alone the person that God wants me to be. How can I be sure that God will accept me as I am? And of course, the answer is that eternal life is not earned or in any way deserved, but is the gift of God. It is the perfect life that Jesus lived and the perfect death in my place for my sin that is 
that it means eternal life can be gifted to me. So I have a future that is certain because it doesn't rest on me and my performance, but on Jesus and his performance. So the Christian wakes up in the morning and says, I have a future that is certain, not because of me, in fact, despite me, but because of Jesus. But I don't just have a future that is certain, I have a future that is glorious. I have a future that is so incredible that that I can barely get my head around it. As a family over the summer, we visited a little island called Alderney in the Channel Islands. It's nearer to, to France. In fact, it's about eight miles from the French coastline. But we Brits are good at traveling to other parts of the world and claiming them as our own. And, and we love the island of Alderney. And there are about 2,000 people who live on the island. And we used a taxi service to get us around from A to B. And we talked to one taxi driver. He took us around most of the time. I think there are probably only three taxis on the island. So we met him quite a lot. And uh, he said that he'd made Alderney his home for the past 30 years. And he said, uh, one of the journeys, he said, I can't remember the last time I locked my front door. He said, I, I can't even, he said, oh, do you know what? I'm not even sure I know where my keys are for my house. He felt totally safe in this little island community where everybody knew everybody else. And it seems to me that Alderney is about as safe a place you could choose to live as I've ever visited. Unlike perhaps where you or I, would I ever leave my door unlocked? I'm not sure. I don't know whether you would. It's a picture of life as we'd like it to be. It's a picture of the kind of world we'd love our kids to grow up in. And yet, for all the glory of Alderney, it's just a glimpse of heaven. Why? Well, they still have to have a police service on Alderney. They still have to have doctors. They still have to have a hospital. And they have graveyards too. Because however good life is, one day you will die. And that means that our future is only temporary in this world. But if we believe that there is a perfect new creation that is still to come, a new order where uh, God can say to us, everything that is wrong with this broken world will be done away with, then we know we have a future that is both certain and glorious, a world without fear, anxiety, and depression, a world without war, famine, and disease, a world without doctors, dentists, or lawyers, a world uninterrupted by death and decay. Sounds glorious, doesn't it? If you're a Christian, when you wake up each day, you say, that is my future. It is certain because of Jesus, and it is glorious. It's beyond my wildest dreams. God in the Bible says this about your future. He says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has even conceived of are the things that God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even imagine the world that you will one day inherit if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And what will make it truly glorious is it will be the world that you will get to share with him. That's what makes heaven heaven. That's a a truly Christian view of heaven. Heaven is more about a person than it is a place. It's being reunited with the one who loved us enough to die for it. He puts the perfect into perfect creation. So it's certain and it's glorious. Now we need to go back to Matthew 25 and our passage uh, for today. And here's the big point, okay? One big point. Even with jet lag, we can get one big point, I think. Okay, the story is about 10 women, okay? It's about 10 women who are all very excited about a wedding celebration that they will get to share in. And they're very excited that the bridegroom is going to pass along the streets. And when he passes along the streets, that means follow him and come to the party. That's the sign that the parties are beginning. So these 10 young women, they're all dressed up. It's party time. It's a wedding. They're equally excited. They're equally expectant. Ask them why they're there. They'll say they'll all say that they're there for exactly the same reason. But here's Jesus' point. Verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. They're all there for the same reason. But five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. Why? The foolish ones, quite simply, didn't take any oil with them for their lamps. Now, there's no street lighting. How do you find your way from A to B? No Google Maps, no lights, nothing. How do you do it? You you need to be able to see where you're going in front of you. The foolish ones took no oil, verse 4. The wise ones took oil in jars along with their lamps. 
And the reason that mattered is because they had no idea when the bridegroom would come. They didn't know when he might arrive. And as it turned out, verse 5 of Matthew 25, verse 5, he was a long time coming. All ten are waiting for the bridegroom to come. The only difference between the two groups is that some of them are ready to wait a long time and others of them are not. They all wanted to go to the celebration, just like all of us who would call ourselves Christians. Look, Jesus could return to establish his kingdom today. That could happen. Why not? It could happen tomorrow. It could happen next year. It might not happen for a thousand years. It may not happen in your lifetime. You don't know. I don't know. Not even the Son himself knows. Only the Father in heaven knows the hour. Are you ready for a long wait? Are you ready to keep hold of that hope that is certain and glorious? Because the danger is we will get ourselves distracted. I think in this parable, the idea of of them falling asleep is this idea of just no longer keeping watch. That's how Jesus, that's his conclusion. That's the very end of the parable, isn't it? What is the message for us? They're written into the very last verse of the parable. Keep watch. Because you don't know how long you may have to wait. Who will be ready And of course, the consequence is frightening because for those who switched off, for those who found themselves not not expectant, not wanting or waiting for Jesus to return, those who weren't ready for when the bridegroom went to the banquet, verse 10, the door was shut. They, They miss out because at some point they had drifted away and the hope in their hearts was not, could it be today? Jesus may come today. Those who had no oil arrived, they banged the door, Lord, Lord, open the door. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. I don't know you, where were you? You weren't there when I invited you to come and to follow. When Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, it is only those who are ready and waiting for him who will enter. Now, if you're someone here and you say, I don't even know whether I am a Christian here today, I've been coming for a while, or I'm interested in Christian things. Can I just really just set out what is the warning in this passage? That Jesus says we need to be those who are ready. In other words, we need to be those who are expectant and acknowledging Jesus as our king and wanting to enter his kingdom. And if, uh, if Jesus had come a little over 30 years ago, I was nowhere near ready. For some of us in the room, it may have been five years ago. For some of us, maybe just a year ago, we'd say, I wasn't a Christian a year ago, but I'm ready now. And so if you're someone here and you don't know where you stand, then can I urge you to get that resolved today? Talk to Terry or Sheila or or talk to myself what, what it would mean to become a Christian, to be someone who was ready and waiting, knowing that Jesus could come today so that we would know that we would share in his celebrations. Verse 13, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. And look back to what's come immediately preceding this parable. Chapter 24, verse 37. And you see there are a whole load of people totally distracted, completely unprepared for the fact that Jesus is coming soon. As it was in the days of Noah, chapter 24, verse 37, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. That's the coming of Jesus. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. They knew nothing. Just like the thousands of people walking up and down past this building today, going shopping, enjoying themselves, St. Patrick's Day Parade, whatever it was, who know absolutely nothing and may know nothing until it's too late. This is how it will be, Jesus says, at the coming of the Son of Man. A whole load of people are not ready for the return of Jesus. Time will reveal where we stand with Jesus. That's what this parable is teaching us. 
We need to be those who are not just ready today, but we need to be people today who would say, I know, what do I want to say to my future self? There's, a, there's an emailing website where you can send in, as long as you keep the same email address, you can write an email to yourself for 10 years from now. Just Google it, you'll find it. There's probably a whole bunch of them. What do you want to write to yourself 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, so that you keep on keeping on and make sure that you're ready? Because you see, even he, we here in the busyness of life could find ourselves just switching off altogether. It makes it hard. We need to watch out. We need to help each other keep, keep focused on Jesus. Verse 13, keep watch, he says. Keep watch and keep on watching. I could only find three books on my bookshelf, and I have a few books. Well, they're shelves, really. They're not one. They're shelves. I have a few of them. Um, I could only find, really, three books that were really about heaven. You know, if you discount systematic theology, that kind of thing, three books that were essentially written because the person that wrote it wanted me to really engage and think about heaven. And arguably, the very best book that has ever been written on the subject of heaven is a book that's now 367 years old, written not very far from here, about 20 miles from here in the, in the town of Kidderminster, Richard Baxter's The Saints' Everlasting Rest. Anyone heard of that? No. Okay, that's great. Not a problem. Published in 16... It's actually uh, 368 years old now because it was published in 1650. And uh, this, is, this is my copy. It's the oldest book I possess. This is from 1658. This is Baxter's Saints Everlasting Rest from 1658. And uh, you can come and have... you careful, you can come and have a look at it in a minute. Because so I have another copy that I use, and this one basically sits on the shelf. 800,000 words. How many words could you write on heaven? 800,000 words on the topic of heaven. And everything it means for us to ensure that we're ready, that we're keeping watch, that we know that we have a future that is certain and glorious and so on. And this is the full title of the book. I mean, there's a few words just in the title. He was uh, using up his word count in his title. But listen to this. Of the blessed state of the saints in their enjoyment of God in glory, Wherein is showed its excellency and certainty, the misery of those that lose it, the way to attain it and assurance of it, and how to live in the continual delightful foretastes of it by the help of meditation. There you go. Try fitting that on one line or the copy of the book. 800,000 words, he said. He was so sure he wanted you to think great thoughts about heaven. So look, three things as we sort of begin to draw our thoughts to a close. Number one, in what ways are we in danger of distraction? In what ways are you in danger of distraction? I guess there might be two ways. There's firstly just the the pull and the love of this world. Living in the Western world, it's very easy to feel at home here, isn't it, in this world? Very easy to to take a transit lounge and set it up and make it look nice. We've got the resources, we've got the opportunity to make quite impressive bus shelters for ourselves. We set up home the pleasures we can enjoy, foreign holidays, good food, 24-7 entertainment, endless shopping, the list goes on. And of course, good health. God has been very kind to us and very generous to us. But 1 John chapter 2, we read these words, Do not love the world or anything in the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. So one way is just getting distracted into the things of life, career, relationships, TV and entertainment, sports, whatever it might be. But the other way in which we can get distracted, and maybe you'll hear someone who's in Christian ministry, is just getting solely focused on ministry in the here and now. That I take my ministry and make it my ultimate goal. Being part of a a church family ought to grow us in not only love for Jesus, but a longing for his return. And maybe you're you're growing your love for Jesus, but not in your longing for his return yet. I think he'd urge you to think on this parable and say, please don't let ministry be the reason that you fall asleep and are not ready for his return. It's possible to just get absorbed in what we're doing for Jesus than in actually anticipating and looking forward to his return.
Okay, so that's the first question. Second question, why is distraction, distraction, I use that word carefully, why is distraction such a dangerous thing? We're going to think about these three questions around our table in a minute. The reason distraction is such a dangerous thing is because it is so very rarely a deliberate decision. It is not a deliberate decision. It is a kind of drifting away, isn't it? It's a falling asleep. Sometimes you don't mean to fall, you just, like some of you now, you're just falling asleep. You know, that's the way it goes on a s Sunday afternoon when you haven't slept much recently. Uh, a friend of mine who passes a church in Birmingham and I, we were due to catch a plane. It was only a short hop to Paris. And we just got really into a conversation. We had our coffee and we had some breakfast and we were there. And then they called final, final announcement and we literally ran and we were the last people they shut the door behind us and we'd gone to the airport to get the plane but we just got into a great conversation and we nearly missed it all together and life can be like that can't it the danger of distraction is it's rarely deliberate and you'll therefore have to find ways to keep yourself awake spiritually how do you fight distraction well i think you learn from the example of jesus Jesus was resolute in his determination to live his life for God and to go the way of the cross. And at various points in the Gospels, you find Jesus taking time out to focus, don't you? In Mark chapter 1, everyone's looking for him. They want him to come and heal everyone. So what does Jesus do? He goes away to a solitary place to pray. The disciples come after him. And what do they say to Jesus? They say, everyone is looking for you. Don't you wish someone would tap you on the shoulder and say, everyone is looking for you. And Jesus says, it's time to go to another place. Because I have come to preach the gospel. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's, let's, let's stay focused. And Luke 9.51, we read those words, don't we? That Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Even though that, of course, was a path to his own death. He was focused all the way through. He knew his journey to heaven was going to be painful and humiliating but the word of God and prayer were his weapons to stay awake, stay awake, stay awake. Don't miss out. Don't miss out. Don't take your eye off the prize. John Wesley says, you know what? That's what the Bible is there for. Listen to what John Wesley had to say. He said, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven. How to land safely on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way. For this very end, he came from heaven, and he hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here I am, far away from the busy ways of men. I sit down alone. Only God is here. In his presence, I open. I read his book for this end, to find the way to heaven. John Wesley, a man of one book, give me that book at any price, give me that book, because this book shows me the way to heaven. It wakes me up spiritually, just as it has this afternoon, as we've just so briefly looked at this parable from Jesus. And then, of course, the other way, God's word and prayer, and a commitment to God's people, and asking them to be committed to us in the local church. My closest friend who led me to Christ lives on the other side of the world, lives actually in Boston. Now, he's lived there for the last three years. And um, he's keeping watch on me from three and a half thousand miles away. And if my life starts to look as if it's a life that is not waiting for Jesus' return, he, is, he knows he has complete permission to challenge me on that. He has permission to challenge me on my marriage, has permission to challenge me on my parenting, supremely has permission to challenge me on my walk with Jesus Christ because I need him more than I know that I need him and you need those people around you too nothing matters more to us than whether we think we have just 70 years maybe 80 if we're doing well in this world or whether we think we have 7 billion billion years to come in the next eternity changes everything. If you believe you have a future that is certain and glorious, then you need to be like these 
young women who said we need to be ready and awake that we might enter that kingdom. Thanks very much for listening. Hannah, back to you. Uh, Thank you, Neil. Right, we're just going to have a two-minute break for you to refresh your cups with coffee and your plates with cake, and I'll bring you back together and we'll discuss the questions that uh, Neil's just gone through. Um, But yeah, first, help yourself to some cake and coffee.